In the jungles of southern Mexico and Central America, the ancient Maya created one of humanity's great civilizations, with stunning achievements in mathematics, astronomy, and art. Their cities were rich with stone inscriptions, grids of fantastic and twisting forms called hieroglyphs, or simply glyphs. There were hundreds of different glyphs, filled with abstract forms, monsters and animals, plants and body parts. They were carved on public monuments and on personal objects of shell, bone and jade, painted on pottery and the walls of buildings, and written in thousands of bark paper screen full books. But when European explorers discovered these inscriptions, no one on earth could read them. What messages did they conceal? Who had made them? Were they pictures and symbols? Or were they true writing, standing for the sounds of a spoken language? For the past 200 years, men and women have struggled to answer these questions. The search has engaged an astonishing range of talents and personalities, linguists and mathematicians, artists and adventurers, archaeologists and eccentrics, each finding a different piece of the puzzle. They experienced bitter isolation, heated rivalry, thrilling collaboration. Finally, their efforts have revealed the true nature of the glyphs and given us all an extraordinary window into the ancient Maya world. As more sites were discovered, explorers did their best to draw and document the glyphs. The forms were unfamiliar, and the monuments were often decayed. But the greatest obstacle was the complexity of the script itself. We now know that the ancient Maya scribes had tremendous latitude for visual creativity. Their system had strict rules, but each time they wrote a given word or phrase, they could choose from a variety of signs and combine them in new ways. They arranged their glyphs in double columns, read from left to right and top to bottom. In their earliest inscriptions, they made each glyph a single sign. Soon, they began to combine up to half a dozen or more signs in a single glyph block. But the graphic complexity of their system went even further. A sign could be written in abstract form, or as the head of a god or animal. One sign could be tucked inside another, or hidden part way behind another. Two signs could fuse together, merging their attributes. Signs even included full figures of monsters and of gods. The art of the system is the genius within which they combine these different possibilities. The graphic component of Maya writing is absolutely overwhelming. You know, that makes it incredibly complicated for us. But to them, they, I mean, it was clearly part of the script. There was an artistry and a playfulness that was as much a part of the system as, as the recording of language. In a great pyre, he burned all the hieroglyphic books he could find, claiming that they contained only lies of the devil. The writing system totally died out uh, in the centuries that followed the Spanish conquest. I mean, people were probably uh, burned at the stake for, for writing in the old system early on. and. Uh, 
by the 18th century, I don't think anybody could write. So they burned hundreds, maybe thousands of books. We will never know. We probably lost forever lots of histories and all. And of course, out of all of that, only four books or partial books survive. One Maya book, probably sent back to Europe by Cortes, made its way to the Royal Library of Dresden, Germany. It is called the Dresden Codex, or manuscript book. Another surfaced in Madrid, a third in Paris, a fourth was found in Mexico in the 1960s. Of all the innumerable books of the Maya, only these four are known to have survived. In 1810, a massive volume on the Americas was published in Paris. One of its illustrations reproduced five pages of the Dresden Codex. This image would inspire the first breakthrough in the decipherment by the eccentric Constantine Raffinesque. It is a positive fact that I have been a botanist, historian, poet, philosopher, merchant, manufacturer, economist, philanthropist, palmist, improver, architect, surveyor, <laughs> and I hardly know myself what I may become as yet. The insatiable Raffinesque was fascinated by these first published images of Maya glyphs. He looked at these bar and dot numbers and he said that, look, um, th there's these bars and dots, but you never get more than four dots. A bar probably stands for five. Uh, one would be a one dot, two would be two dots, three would be three dots, four, four dots, then you'd have a bar, and then a dot would make it six. Two dots and a bar are seven, three dots and a bar eight, and so on. And that was the first time anybody had ever deciphered a Maya hieroglyph. That is the beginning of the decipherment. Gradually, Firstman worked out how the Maya marked time a system now called the calendar round. The calendar round is made up of three interlocking cycles, a 365-day solar year, a cycle of 20 names, and a cycle of 13 numbers. Days are designated by the way these three cycles line up. For example, this day is three manique, and the 14th of the month, Pope, followed by four Lamat, 15 Pope, five Muluk, 16 Pope, and so on. 52 years will pass before the three cycles line up in the same way again. Then, these days will repeat. Like our days of the week, the calendar round cycles on and on forever. It is not by itself tied to any specific starting point in history. But Firstman's greatest triumph came when he realized that some very large numbers in the Venus pages of the Dresden were counts back in time. They tied the Venus records to an historical starting point thousands of years earlier. It fell on the calendar round day for a how eight kumku. From Maudsley's photographs, Firstman knew that this extraordinarily ancient date appeared throughout the Maya world, from Palenque in northern Chiapas to Quirigua in southern Guatemala. Firstman concluded that for the Maya, this date marked the creation of the universe. Just as Western culture measures its history from the birth of Christ, so the Maya measured their history from the date of creation. This system of dating is known as the long count. In May of 1945, the Russian army marched into Berlin. With them was a young officer named Yuri Valentinovich Konorosov. He was an artillery spotter for the Red Army. 
the least likely person to have made the greatest of all breakthroughs in the Maya decipherment. He entered Berlin during the fall of Berlin. And this is the story he told me once, although I've heard different stories. In the uh, ruins of the National Library, he found a book lying there uh, that had survived the, the fires and all the rest of it that he picked up, which was a very good black and white reproduction of the three then known codices, the Dresden, the Madrid Codex, and the one in Paris. According to another version of the story, Konarasov discovered the book when crates from Berlin were unpacked in Moscow. In any case, he became fascinated by the glyphs. When he read an article concluding that Maya glyphs were an insoluble problem, Konarasov took it as a challenge. He completed a degree in linguistics and became a lone Russian Mayanist in a field then dominated by Eric Thompson and Western scholars. Knorozov at this point, uh, and until his last days, was ensconced uh, uh, on the second floor of the old Ethnographic Institute. And Knorozov was in a room that had uh, five or six other people in it also with their desk, but he had the best desk, which was right by the window, which was somewhat frosted up from the freezing cold, looking right out on the Neva River and all the ice piled up in the Neva. because he was behind the Iron Curtain during the Stalinist period, he also was intrinsically very isolated. He didn't have a lot of ideas floating around that he had inherited from other people, ideas that, in Thompson's case, were quite simply wrong. It gave him a fresh perspective. He was kind of a, a clean slate, you might say. He was able to make key insights based on uh, his experiences in other fields. I think that's the crucial thing. He had worked with Coptic, he, he knew Egyptian hieroglyphs. He was, in a sense, the, the perfect person with his linguistic knowledge uh, to direct himself towards Maya glyphs uh, and see that as something that has to be comprehensible. Konarasov knew from his linguistic studies that the first step in analyzing an unknown writing system is to count the signs. If it has between 20 and 35 signs, the script is probably alphabetic, representing simple sounds. If it has 80 to 100 signs, an unknown script is probably syllabic. A syllabary will have more signs than an alphabet because it represents all the possible combinations of consonant and vowel sounds used in a language. But if the unknown script has more than a few hundred signs, it is surely logographic, or based on signs for whole words. A richly logographic system like Chinese has thousands of signs for thousands of words. The Maya script has about 800 signs, too many to be an alphabet or a syllabary, far too few to have signs for each word of a language. So scholars assumed for a long time that it was a very limited, purely logographic system, with signs for only a few hundred words. But Konarasov was sure they were wrong. But the era of lone scholars scattered about the world was coming to an end. The change began at Palenque, where an extraordinary collaborative effort burst on the scene in the early 1970s. The catalyst of this effort was Merle Green Robertson, an artist and school teacher. She had spent years living near the site and documenting its crumbling reliefs. Patterns here with the eye in the center. Well, these go all across the building in rows. And then on the next row, there's a different pattern. This is like a bell shaped flower. Well, it must have been gorgeous at the time that it was uh, in its heyday. I was so interested in the art of Palenque that um, I just wanted to record them so they'd be there for posterity. for future scholars to study and so forth. In 1970, 
As Robertson was documenting the paintings and reliefs of Palenque, a young art teacher named Linda Sheely happened on the site during a vacation trip to Mexico. When I walked among Palenque's buildings, I saw a culture where the art was central. And I really was driven to understand who had done it and why and how. Sheely became Robertson's assistant. As they worked, she came to know Palenque intimately. We had a plank about a foot wide that we have to walk out on when we set up the camera. So Lynn and I would sit there and we would argue about uh, all the things that people didn't know about Palenque and we'd have all the answers and then the next night we'd change our mind and the answers would be different. And Merle, as she began to build her house, created a center where everyone was welcome, where all of the material that she had was available to anybody that wanted to use it. And that became crucially important to the, to the early 70s, that uh, young, stupid, ignorant people like me were allowed to come and sit at the feet of people. And uh, there was never, in a lot of places, I was rejected because I didn't have a PhD and I wasn't from an Ivy League college. Uh, Merle didn't give a damn for that. In the fall of 1973, Robertson invited about 30 people to gather over Christmas break to discuss the art and inscriptions of Palenque. It was the first major scholarly conference ever to be held at a Maya site. It was dubbed a Mesa Redonda, Spanish for round table. Senior scholars and young students were welcomed on equal terms. I mean, this, this was the mother of all meetings. Even though there were only a handful of us there, every single person there at that meeting had something to contribute and something to say that nobody had ever heard of or even conceived of before. I'm still amazed at what happened then in terms of just the brilliance of going to a site that had a lot of inscriptions and talking about it so that if somebody said, I forgot what that glyph looked like, they could go right out to the site and look at it and, and verify something. They were there with all the data, and it was just a wonderful atmosphere in which to work. As the decipherment entered the 1980s, fewer than 30 syllabic signs could be read with confidence. There was still a missing key that held back the flood. That final key was uncovered by David Stewart, whose informal education as a Mayanist began at a very early age. His father, George, worked for the National Geographic Society and often brought him along on his work trips to Mesoamerica. When David was eight years old, George Stewart took his family to Coba in the Yucatan. It was around these gorgeous lakes big pyramids covered by forest. But I, I distinctly remember for the first uh, two or three weeks just hating it. It was hot, there were a lot of bugs. You know, we were all kind of crammed into this Maya hut. But I found myself, you know, looking at the ruins and kind of wandering around. It was just kind of an incredible place to wander around as a kid. What really got me though was, while we were at Koba, there were a couple of monuments that were actually discovered. My dad would drop everything and work on drawing the monument. And I would just sort of look over his shoulder while he was doing that and thought, gee, you know, this is, this is pretty amazing. He decided he would go out and uh, draw some himself. So he'd take his crayons and paper and everything and go out, pencils, and, and started drawing hieroglyphs. By the time we got back to the States, my inner soul had been so affected by that experience that I just wanted to keep going back. Two years later, in Washington, D.C., David met Linda Sheely in the offices of National Geographic. He was 10 years old. I remember kind of sitting there quietly in the office while she was talking to several people who were kind of gathered around her. And so she was drawing a glyph, and I, I, I don't know why I blurted this out, because 
you know, I, I wasn't a very outgoing kid, I think, but I, I said, oh, that's a fire glyph. And, and Slinda kind of paused, and I remember she sort of looked behind her shoulder and over at me and said, yeah, you're right, kid, that's a fire glyph. And I think it was the same night, we all went out to a restaurant on 16th Street in Washington. George said that they would really appreciate it if there was ever a chance that David could study with me or something. And so on the spur of the moment, I said, well, why don't, why didn't he come down to Palenque this summer? And the next summer was one of the most amazing times of my life. She allowed me to help her check her drawings. You know, we were in the temples with flashlights, with her drawings on clipboards, making corrections. I remember Linda was saying, okay, kid, you know, if you want to learn Maya glyphs, you gotta, you gotta do it on your own. You know, I'll help you, but, you know, she wasn't just showing me what things were. I mean, I had to go in and kind of work it out myself. I gave him the tablet of the cross, told him to go out on the back porch and figure out as much as he could about it. He came back a couple of days later and, and had his, the same amount of structural understanding of the text that it had taken me and Peter and Floyd and Dave Kelly three years to do. And so I figured then that he was, he was really quite good. Ya leyendo los textos me doy cuenta de que es la historia que nunca, nunca me lo enseñaron en la escuela. Entonces, um, sí, es uh, muy, muy importante para nosotros porque es la historia que no conocemos. Entonces empezamos aquí, acá, acá, terminamos, se sentó, y después de se sentó, por supuesto que es el nombre del personaje, ¿verdad? These hieroglyphic workshops in Guatemala have continued ever since, and new workshops have started elsewhere in the Maya region. Maya veterans of the early workshops are now teaching the glyphs and the history they contain to other Maya. Al ver este, digamos, eh, las ideas que se encierran en la epigrafía Maya, pues nos sorprendemos de que eh, son ideas que existían desde, desde aquella época y que han permanecido en la actualidad. Nos ayuda a descubrir nuestras raíces y nos ayuda a consolidar nuestra identidad como mayas. Knowing the history of your country is of immense charge and value because you get to understand things and know things that even today have some present day meaning. It's not just names or dates, it's the sense of who you are as part of something. For 400 years, the suppression of Maya language and writing had been part of the repression of Maya culture. Maya children were taught to speak and write in Spanish, given Christian names, and discouraged from speaking Mayan. Now Maya children are beginning to learn the hieroglyphs and history of their ancestors. And Maya parents are naming their babies after ancient Maya lords. <laughs> 